Hello everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video we're going to find out how to find the maximum and minimum values of a function. So this is one of the most important applications of differential calculus involving optimization problems where we're trying to find the optimal value of a function, its maximum or minimum value. So here are some examples of where optimization might come in. You want to have, you have a can in the shape of a cylinder and you want to max, you want to minimize the manufacturing cost. You have um, a space shuttle and you want to maximize it, its acceleration. You have a contracted windpipe, the radius and expels air through the windpipe and you want to have the radius be in such a way that you can expel the most amount of air during a cough and an angle for blood vessels to branch so that the, it will minimize the amount of energy expended by the heart in pumping blood. So those are all examples of optimization problems. You want to either maximize or minimize a particular function. So we're going to determine how do you find the critical numbers of a function using Fermat's theorem, how to use the extreme value theorem to find the absolute max and absolute min of a continuous function on a closed interval, and then some application problems involving absolute max and absolute minimum. So this is, we're going to start with the section with a review. What does it mean that you have an absolute maximum and absolute minimum of a function? We have this function in the graph that's given below. What are the absolute maximum and minimum values of the function? The absolute maximum, or just absolute max, is the highest point on the graph. Of the graph of f of x if we call this f of x and the absolute minimum is the lowest point on the graph of the function. So if we're looking at this function's graph, the absolute maximum is the highest point on the graph. So absolute max or absolute maximum. The absolute maximum is the y value. The highest or largest y value is 5. So the absolute maximum of f of x is y equals 5 and it occurs when x equals 3. On the other hand, the absolute minimum is the lowest point on the graph which appears to be y equals 2 is the absolute minimum so don't say the absolute max or absolute minimum is the point itself the maximum absolute maximum is referring to the y value the absolute minimum is referring to the y value and the absolute minimum occurs when x equals 6 so that's how you find absolute maximum and an absolute minimum using the graph. This is the formal definition of an absolute maximum and absolute minimum of a function. You have a number C that is in a domain. That means some interval, closed, half closed or half open or open interval. For a function f of x, 
the y value, f of c, is called the absolute maximum of the function on the particular domain, so on that interval, it's called the absolute maximum, if the y value at the that's the absolute maximum is greater than or equal to all other y values on that domain. The absolute minimum value on that domain is f of c. If f of c is less than or equal to all the other y values on that same domain. Sometimes absolute maximum and absolute minimum, minimum values are called global max or global min, minimum, because you're talking, you're, you usually refer to absolute max and min on the entire graph, but it does not necessarily have to be the entire graph. In either case, maximum and minimum values are called extreme values. So anytime it's you hear the word extreme values, it's referring to absolute max and absolute min, the extreme of the graph. So in terms of the graph, the absolute maximum is at D, X equals D is where it occurs, because this is the largest Y value on this domain. The absolute minimum is at x equals a, because this is the smallest or lo uh, lowest y value for this entire graph on the domain we're considering. d comma f of d is the highest point, and a comma f of a is the lowest point. So absolute minimum is f of a. y equals f of a, and the absolute maximum is y equals f of d in this graph. On the other hand, there's also what's called a local max and a local min. If you only consider x values that are near a real number c, x equals c, f of c is the largest of those y values, and it's called the local max of f of x. So in terms of the graph, notice that x equals c it's not the absolute maximum because it's not the highest point on the entire domain, but it is the highest y value considering all the y values close to it. So it's called a local max and it's still a y value. F of C is the local max. On the other hand, if you consider only the values that are near X equals E, f of e is the smallest of the y values and it's called a local minimum. So at x equals e, it's not the smallest y value on the entire domain, but it is the smallest y value in that neighborhood. And that is a mathematical term, neighborhood. So in this neighborhood, this open interval, it's the smallest y value. So f of e, y equals f of e, is called the local minimum. Sometimes people refer local as relative, relative maximum or relative minimum. So be on the, on the lookout. Local or relative mean the same thing. So the definition of a local max or local min, it's still the y value. It's a local max if f of c is greater than f of x, or f of c is greater than equal to f of x. All the other y values are less than the maximum, but you only consider 
x values that are close to c. And same thing for local minimum. It's a y value that is smaller than all the other y values when you consider x values close to c. So we're only, for local max and local min, we're only worried about what happens near x equals c. So some small open interval about x equals c. So here's what this is referring to. Say you have a graph. This is, let's say, y equals f of x again. The absolute minimum of this graph on the entire domain is the lowest point on the graph. So this is a low absolute minimum. It looks like it is at, at x equals 12. It looks like it's about y equals 3. So y equals 3 is the absolute minimum. But you still have y values that are larger than other y values in its neighborhood. And same thing here. This has a smallest y value in that neighborhood. So this is called a local or relative max. It occurs when x equals 8. And it looks like the y value is about 7. So this is y equals 7. And this local minimum is looks like y equals 5. So this is the smallest y value in that neighborhood, that open interval. So all these x values that are close to x equals 4 are have a, have a larger y value than f of 4. The local max is at x equals 8. All the x values that are close to it have smaller y values. So this is a local max. And an absolute minimum is automatically a local minimum as well. So if it's the smallest y value on the entire domain, it's definitely the smallest y value in its neighborhood. So it's a local min and an absolute min. So let's look at example one. The graph is provided below of this polynomial function. Find the absolute maximum and minimum values over the indicated intervals. So let's look at one interval that's a closed interval first. The closed interval negative 1 to 4. So we're only looking at starting at x equals negative 1 and we're going up to x equals 4. Find the absolute max and absolute min. The absolute maximum is, looks like the largest y value on the entire domain from negative 1 to 4 is 37. So f of negative 1, which is 37. The absolute minimum occurs when x equals 3 and the minimum is negative 27. Now if we change up the domain then so will the absolute max and absolute min. So now let's try a different interval. Number 2 we're going to do the, we're going to look at the half open, or you can call it half closed if you like, if like, if you like that term better. It doesn't matter which one you use. Including x equals 1, but not including 4. Okay, let's look back at the graph. 
So this time we're looking at x equals 1. And we're going up to x equals 4. 1 is included this time. And x equals 4 is not included. So it's an open circle. So we're only focused on x equals 1 is the left endpoint of the graph. And the right endpoint is at x equals 4, but not including x equals 4. It looks like you have a absolute minimum at x equals 3, and it's negative 27 again. F of 3. And it was negative 27 for the absolute minimum. But notice that there is no absolute max. It would have occurred, the absolute max would have occurred at x equals 4, but x equals 4 is not included as part of the domain that we were, con we were concerned with. So this graph, this, this uh, function f of x, from x equals 1 to 4 has an absolute min, but no absolute max. There is no largest y value for the function on the domain. Since x equals 4 is, is not part of the domain. from 1 to 4, open, half open, half closed. Okay, one more. Let's try the open interval this time. From negative 1 to 3. So open, not including negative 1, and not including x equals 3. So this time, x equals negative 1 is not included. So that's an open circle at x equals negative 1. And we're only concerned about the interval from negative 1 to 3. And now that one's not included either, if it's an open interval. The absolute max would have been 37, but that point's not included as part of the domain. So there is no absolute max. For the same reason, there is no absolute minimum because it would have been negative 27 if this point was included. But since it's an open interval, no absolute maximum. Since x equals negative 1 is not part of the domain. which was negative 1 to 3, open. And same reason, no absolute minimum either. Since x equals 3 is where it would have occurred, but it's x equals 3 is not part of the domain. So as these three examples have shown, or three parts of the example, the only part where you are guaranteed to have an absolute max and an absolute minimum was the first problem. We are guaranteed to have an absolute max and an absolute min because we considered the endpoints from negative 1 to 4. If we change it to a half open or half closed, we would have an absolute minimum. We may not have an absolute max. We were not guaranteed to have both. And an open interval, it didn't seem like we had either one in this case. So the interval, the domain, it does matter which interval you're concerned about finding the absolute max and min. With that in mind, this introduces what's called the extreme value theorem.
the extreme value theorem gives you conditions on when you can expect an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum for a function. So the conditions are important for this theorem. The function must be continuous, so no breaks, no jumps, no vertical asymptotes in the graph, and the domain must be a closed interval from A to B. If those two conditions are satisfied, then the function attains an absolute maximum value, f of c, and it also attains an absolute minimum, f of d, where x equals c and x equals d is somewhere on this interval, this closed interval. It could be an endpoint, or it could be an interior point. So c and d, c could be a, or c could be b, and, and same thing for d. d could be a, or d could be equal to b. But c and d could also be between a and b. So this is what the dot, this, these graphs are illustrating. Your extreme values, the absolute max and absolute min, can be taken on different, different cases. On this first example, this is the absolute max on the domain A to B and the absolute min. So the max, absolute max and absolute min occurred between x equals A and x equals B. That can happen. You could also have an absolute max at an interior point between A, x equals A and x equals B, but the absolute minimum could be an end, end point. You could have more than one absolute max, or you could have loc more than one location for an absolute max if the y values are the same. You have one absolute max, but it occurs at C1 and C2, but only one absolute minimum. And these last two graphs, there is no absolute max that point's not included but you do have an absolute minimum it looks like it's uh, f of 2 is equal to 0 so the minimum value is 0 keep in mind the theorem says you are guaranteed to have both absolute max and an absolute min if the function is continuous and closed interval. This is a closed interval from x equals 0 to x equals 2, but it's not continuous, so I'm not guaranteed to have both. So I have an absolute max or absolute min, but there is no absolute max. And on the other hand, there is no absolute min. That point's not included, open, and there is no absolute max. It looks like the graph is approaching a vertical asymptote. So the y values will grow arbitrarily large. So this is another example of the extreme value theorem does not apply. The function is not continuous at x equals 2 or x equals 0, and it's not even a closed interval. It's not including 0, and it's not including 2. The only case where you have absolute max and an absolute min is closed interval, continuous. Continuous, closed interval. Continuous, closed interval. The only disadvantage about the extreme value theorem is that it does not tell you how to find the absolute max and min. The extreme value theorem is sometimes called an existence theorem. It tells you that the absolute max and absolute min exist, but it does not tell you how to find them. So now this introduces a new problem. How do you find the absolute max and absolute min if the function is continuous 
and it's on a closed interval. Well, one way that we can find them is using the idea that the only way you can have a local max or local min is if there's a horizontal tangent line. So there's a horizontal tangent line when x equals c, the derivative at c is 0, and at d, it looks like you have a horizontal tangent line. So that is f prime of d equals 0. The reason why we want to look for the slope is equal to the slope of the tangent line equals zero is because this is where the graph changes from increasing to decreasing. So you have a local max. And this would be a local min. It's changing from decreasing to increasing. Now, if we only look at the domain from x equals a to x equals b, then this is the absolute max on that closed interval a to b. And the absolute minimum would be here. Because if you're only considering a, x equals a to x equals b, this is the lowest point on that domain. So this gives us a way to find out where could an absolute max and absolute min occur. They could occur when you have a horizontal tangent line. So this is what's called Fermat's theorem. Fermat has been known since the 1700s. He discovered that this, this fact about local max and local minimum values. A function has a local max or a local minimum at x equals c if the derivative exists at c and the derivative is equal to zero at c. So the slope of the tangent line is zero. Tells you if you have a local max or a local min, that tells you that you have a horizontal tangent line. So, for example, the converse is not true, though. If you have a horizontal tangent line, that does not mean you have a local max and a local min. So here's an example. f of x equals x cubed. Let's say we find all the x values where there's a horizontal tangent line first. f prime is equal to 3x squared. Set equal to zero to find out the, horse, the x values for the horizontal tangent line, and you find x equals zero. Well, x equals zero is here. Yep, you do have a horizontal tangent line at x equals zero. But you can you notice that at this point, the origin zero comma zero, it's not a local max and it's not a local min. So the converse is not true. Just because you have a horizontal tangent line does not mean it's a max or a min. It could be this situation where the graph is increasing and then it's, it's increasing more slowly and then it's increasing again, but faster. No local max, no local min. It does not change from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. Let's look at the other example. This function is the absolute value of x. We saw this earlier in the, in the class, that f prime of 0 does not exist. You have what's called a corner at x equals 0. So the derivative does not exist at x equals 0, but this is the absolute minimum of the function. The smallest y value for the absolute value of x is y equals 0.
So you could have an absolute minimum or an absolute maximum where the derivative doesn't even exist. So Fermat's theorem says if there's a local max or a local minimum and the derivative does exist, the derivative must be zero. So, keeping in mind Fermat's theorem to find out these absolute max and absolute minimum values, they were given a name. Anytime that you're looking for an x value where the derivative is equal to zero at C, or the derivative does not exist at C, these x values that are called x equals C, they are called critical numbers. So a critical number of a function is a x value, x equals C, where the derivative at C is zero, or the derivative at C does not exist. Okay, so example two. We're going to find critical numbers for a few different types of functions. So number one, f of x equals x cubed plus 3x squared. Subtract 24x. So this is a polynomial function. Find all the critical numbers. So find the derivative. 3x squared plus 6x subtract 24. Notice that the derivative will never be undefined for any x value. But you could have a critical number when the derivative is equal to 0. So take the derivative and set it equal to 0. And solve for x. So it looks like we can factor out a 3. And I believe that trinomial will factor further. x plus 4 and x subtract 2. So it looks like we have x equals negative 4, x equals 2. These are called critical numbers. These are the x values where the derivative is 0. Okay, number two. Let's try g of x equals x cubed plus x squared plus x. So another polynomial function. So find the critical numbers. Take the derivative. 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. Notice again that the derivative g prime of x will never be undefined. So we won't have critical numbers that way. But we could have critical numbers when the derivative is equal to 0. Now, if you solve this equation, this quadratic equation for x, you're going to notice that the discriminant from the quadratic formula, b squared subtract 4ac, is 2 squared subtract 4 times 3 times 1. This is 4 subtract 12, which is negative 8. Negative. So this means that the number inside the square root of the quadratic formula will be negative 8. There's no real solutions to this equation. which means no critical numbers. For g of x. So this function g of x will have no critical numbers. g prime is never equal to zero for any real number. 
and g prime of x is always defined. So no critical numbers. So no horizontal tangent lines and no cusp or corners in the graph. Number three. How about a rational function? h of x equals x subtract 1 divided by x squared subtract x plus 1. So this is a rational function. Take the derivative. Define your critical numbers. So use the quotient rule to find the derivative. So low times the derivative of the top, d high, minus high, d low, which is 2x minus 1, all divided by the denominator squared. So we do have to simplify because we want to solve an equation afterwards. So if you simplify, uh, we'll need to FOIL this and keep track of the negative. x squared subtract x plus 1, subtract 2x squared, subtract 1, plus 2x, and plus x, divided by denominator squared. Okay, so if you simplify, the derivative will be the opposite of x squared plus 2x divided by denominator, which was squared. Ones will cancel out and combine like terms. Okay, notice that this derivative could equal zero. And a fraction is equal to zero is if the numerator is zero. So this implies negative x squared plus 2x equals zero. Solving this equation, you'll find out that x equals zero or x equals two. So these are called critical numbers. It's where the derivative is equal to zero. However, this is the first time that we have to be concerned about where is the derivative undefined. It's potentially when the denominator of the fraction is equal to zero. So x squared subtract x plus one equals zero. After you take the square root to cancel out the square, you'll get this equation equals zero. However, this equation also has no real solutions. So there are no critical numbers when the derivative is, equal to, is undefined, but there were two critical numbers when the derivative was zero. So only x equals zero and x equals two are called critical numbers. So this gives you an idea of how to find critical numbers for a function. It's where the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. Okay, so in terms of Fermat's theorem, it can be rephrased in terms of local max and local mins. f of x has a local maximum or local minimum, then it is at x equals c, then x equals c is where there's a critical number. That's how Fermat's theorem can be restated in terms of critical numbers. Local max or local min means x equals c is a critical number. So now we have a method on how to find the absolute max and absolute minimum for a function. So if the function is continuous, remember that's important for the extreme value theorem, and the function is defined on a closed interval, a to b, remember that was the other con important condition, 
We know we will have an absolute max and an absolute minimum, but how do we find them? There's a three-step procedure we can use. Step one, we know that if you have a local maximum or a local minimum, they could also be absolute max and an absolute min. So step one, find all the critical numbers on the interval, the closed interval A to B. There could be some critical numbers outside that interval, but only consider the critical numbers in this closed interval A to B. Next, after you have all the critical numbers, also consider the endpoints. Because we've, we've noticed this before, you could have an absolute max and an absolute minimum at an endpoint of the closed interval. So include x equals a and x equals b as your endpoints. Once you have all the critical numbers and your endpoints, substitute all those x values into the function and the largest of the y values is the absolute max and the smallest of the y values is the absolute min. And that's how you find absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on a closed interval. So let's try this process out on example three. Find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum provided they exist for the function f of x equals 10x times 2 minus natural log of x in parentheses on this interval, 1 to e squared. All right, step one, make sure you actually have an absolute max and an absolute min. So make sure the extreme value theorem can be applied. Condition number one, is the function continuous on the closed interval 1 to e squared? And the function was 10 times x to subtract natural log of x. 10 times x, that's a polynomial. That's, there are no issues with domain for 10 times x. The only issue that I noticed is that natural log of x, I cannot substitute in negative values of x or x equals 0. Otherwise, natural log of x does not exist. But from 1 to e squared, this function is continuous. So that's the first condition. Good. Second condition. We have a closed interval. And we do. It's, it's including x equals 1 and including e squared. So by the extreme value theorem, there is an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on this domain. There exists an absolute max and absolute minimum on 1 e squared. The graph is given just as a way to check your answer at the end. Okay, so now let's go through the three-step process. Step one, find the critical numbers. We could have an absolute max and an absolute minimum occur at a critical number. And the function was f of x equals 10x times 2 minus natural log of x. So find your critical numbers. We did this in example two. Take the derivative. You're going to have to use the product rule. First function times the derivative of the second plus the second function times the derivative of the first. Keep in mind, we're going to set this equal to zero or find out where the derivative is 
undefined, so simplify completely. 10 and then 20 minus 10 natural log of x. So the derivative is, uh, that should be a negative 10. So 10, subtract 10 natural log of x, or 10 times 1 minus natural log of x, after you have a factor out the 10. We are interested in where is this derivative 0, or undefined. To find the critical numbers. We'll notice that we have natural log of x again. That's not going to be undefined on the domain where we are considering from 1 to e squared, so that one's okay. But where is the derivative of 0? 10 minus 1 times natural log, or 1 minus natural log of x equals 0 implies that natural log of x equals 1, because 10 cannot be 0, but 1 minus natural log of x equals 0 means natural log of x equals 1, and if you solve for x, by changing this back to exponential form, x is e. The only way that natural log is 1 is if it's natural log of e is 1. So this is a critical number. It's where the derivative is 0. And like I said before, the derivative is not undefined. It's defined everywhere on our domain. So step two, once you have the critical number, also include the endpoints of the domain. The endpoints were x equals 1 and x equals e squared. And now substitute in the values, the critical number and your endpoints, into the original function. The largest y value is the absolute max, and the smallest y value is the absolute minimum. So if you substitute in x equals 1 into the original function, it will turn out to be 20. If you substitute in e, you'll get 10 times e, which is approximately 27.128. And then substituting e squared into the original function, you will get 0. So it looks like the absolute maximum is f of e, which is 10 times e. And the absolute minimum is f of e squared, which gives you 0, which is the smallest y value. So we are guaranteed to have an absolute max and an absolute min, and we found them. Absolute max is 10 times e, and the absolute min is 0. So that's one application of finding the absolute max and absolute min. Let's try example 4. This time, same instructions, find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum, if they exist, for the function f of x equals x to the two-thirds on the closed interval negative 2 to 3. Alright, make sure that we actually do have an absolute max and an absolute min. So the extreme value theorem. The function is f of x equals x to the two-thirds, and the domain is negative 2 to 3. This is also written as the cube root of x squared. Keep in mind that if it's an odd root, it doesn't matter if the inside of the root is positive or negative, they're always defined. So this is a defined function, it's continuous, for all x values on the domain negative 2 to 3. 
So no holes in the graph, no jumps, no asymptotes. It's good. And it is a closed interval. Negative 2 is included, 3 is included. That's good. So we will have an absolute max and an absolute min. Using the extreme value theorem. So now, how to find them? Find the critical numbers by taking the derivative. Use the power rule. 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Now it's important to rewrite this. It is 2 divided by 3 x to the 1 third which is 2 divided by 3 and then the cube root of x. So f prime of x equals 0. This fraction equals 0 when the numerator is 0. But the numerator is 2. So this never happens. This never occurs. So the derivative is never equal to 0 for any x value. So no horizontal tangent lines, but the derivative could be undefined when the denominator is 0. So take the denominator, solve for x, and you'll find that x equals 0 is your only critical number. So once you have the critical number, now include the critical number and your endpoints to determine which of the endpoints or the critical number gives you the largest or the smallest y value. So let's do that over here. So you have uh, f of negative 2, that's an endpoint. x equals 0 is a critical number. And f of 3, would x equals 3, is the other endpoint. These go back into the original function because we need the y values. If you substitute in negative 2, it will be negative 2 to the 2 thirds. That is the cube root of 4, which is about, where is that, 1.587. f of 0 is 0 to the 2 thirds, that's 0. And f of 3 would be 3 to the 2 thirds, that is the cube root of 9, which is about 2.08, and then a 0. So it looks like the absolute maximum is f of 3 or cube root of 9. The absolute minimum is f of 0 which was 0. And like I said before we were guaranteed to have the absolute max and an absolute min by the extreme value theorem and now we found them. And just to check with the graph you notice that f of 0 gives you a cusp that was x equals 0 was a critical number where the derivative was undefined. So you could have an absolute uh, minimum when you have a cusp and that's exactly what we found and the absolute maximum was at x equals 3 and it was the cube root of 9. Okay, so let's finish up the section with this application of absolute max and absolute min. It's about the Hubble Space Telescope. It was deployed in April 24, 1990, so already 30 years ago, by the Space Shuttle Discovery. The model for the velocity of the Space Shuttle 
during the mission from liftoff at t equals zero until the solid rocket boosters were jettisoned at 126 seconds is given by this function. This is the velocity function in feet per second. Using this model, estimate the absolute max, absolute min for the acceleration between the liftoff and the jettisoning of the rocket boosters. So be very careful about the wording of this problem. They're not asking you to find the absolute max and absolute min of the velocity, not the original function. Find the absolute maximum or minimum of the acceleration. So find the acceleration first. That is the derivative of velocity. It will be 0 0.003609 t squared. Subtract 0 0.18058t plus 23.61. We need to find the absolute maximum and minimum of this function. So now go through the steps to use the extreme value theorem on a of t. This function is a polynomial. Polynomial functions are continuous, so that condition is satisfied. And notice that we are only finding the max and min between the liftoff and the jettisoning of the rocket boosters between t equals 0 and t equals 126. That is a closed interval. So by the extreme value theorem, we are guaranteed to have an absolute max and an absolute minimum, which means an absolute maximum acceleration and an absolute minimum acceleration. So now find the critical numbers for a of t by taking the derivative. So the derivative of acceleration, 0.007218t. Subtract 0 0.18058. The derivative will not be undefined, but it could be equal to 0 to find critical numbers. And if you solve for t, you'll find t is equal to 23.12. And time is in seconds. So this is a critical number for a of t. So the extreme value theorem says you will have an absolute max and an absolute min either at the critical number or an endpoint. So acceleration at 0 seconds or 23.12 seconds or 126 seconds when the rocket boosters were jettisoned. When you calculate these values, the acceleration at 0 seconds, 23.61. Acceleration is feet and per second squared for the units. 23.12 seconds, the acceleration was 21.52 feet per second squared. And 126 seconds, 62 point eight seven feet per second squared. So we find out that the absolute maximum acceleration is A of 126, 62.87 feet per second squared. And the absolute minimum acceleration occurred at the critical number. It was at 23.12 seconds, and the acceleration was 21.52 feet per second squared. And those are the absolute max and absolute min for acceleration.
So this finishes up the section. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. And as you work through the homework, if you have any questions, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video.